Good morning and welcome to Living Hope. My name is Jeannie Greenman. November is the month of extra Thanksgiving and we are so thankful to all of the veterans that have served our country. Here are some of the events that are coming up this month. Are you new to our church? On December 1st, we will be having a pastor welcome class starting at 9 a.m. They will be breaking for both the second service and the third service, depending on which one you prefer. So don't miss out. It's that time of year again. It is time for our pastor's favorite Koinonia night. Our Thanksgiving Koinonia night will be November 24th at 5 p.m. with worship following at 6. Please sign up to bring your favorite side dish or dessert in the church foyer. Good News Club still needs volunteers for Topaz Elementary. If you're interested in sharing the gospel with elementary students, contact Tyrone Turner. The women's ministry is teaming up with His Love Humanitarian Outreach to create care packages for homeless women. Drop off toiletries and sanitary supplies at the church office or bring them on packing day. Join us in serving, or if you can't donate, share words of encouragement on the index cards in the foyer. These will be included with the packages. Let's make a difference together. Skate Riot Ministries is partnering with the local beauty school to help high school students shine on prom night. Want to pitch in? We're collecting prom dresses, shoes, suits, and accessories. Drop your donations in the box outside the church office. Let's make prom unforgettable for them. Here at Living Hope, we are big on spiritual growth. We would love to help you on that journey. You'll notice there are QR codes on the back of the seat in front of you. If you are new to our church or want to get to know us a little better, we would love to get to know you. You can use the welcome QR code to share your thoughts with us. Let us know that you want to get more involved, whatever it is you'd like to do. The second QR code is the service QR code. We use that to find out where you fit into the ministries of our church. If you want a little bit more information on any of them, you can use the serve code in order to get involved. If you would like to support Living Hope financially, we have several ways to do so. You'll notice in the second service we pass the plates. You can also put your tithes and offerings into the black boxes at the back of the sanctuary after service. If you want to give electronically, you can use the Give QR code on the back of the seat in front of you. We're glad that you've chosen to worship with us here at Living Hope, and we're looking forward to getting to know you better. Kids, if you haven't already, you can be excused to the back. All right, thank you guys for joining us this morning here at Living Hope Church. Before we start, I wanna take uh, the opportunity just to recognize the veterans who are here with us today. So if you serve this country, if you are a veteran, would you please just take this second to stand up and we wanna go ahead and clap for you. So. Thank you for your service. Thank you for joining us on this Veterans Day weekend. My name is Jonathan and we're gonna be talking about marriage today and what the gospel has to say about marriage. What does God have to say about marriage? So I wanna do one more thing before we pray and read God's word together. If you've been married for at least five years, let's see who's the longest, person, longest married here today. Go ahead and stand up if you've been married for at least five years today, if you're willing to enable, go ahead. Okay, praise God, praise God. How about stay standing if you've been married for at least 10 years? Okay, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. And all right, looks like, how long over here? 35, praise God. Praise God. Let's go ahead and let's, uh, let's begin with the word of prayer, and then we'll get into what uh, God's word has to say to us this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you uh, for bringing us all here today. I know that everybody who walked in through these doors today, God, is, is somewhere different with you, Lord. I know that for some of us, it's everything's going well, and we thank you for that. For others, it was a struggle just to get here today. Lord, wherever anybody is at, we thank you that you are the same through it all. We thank you that your word can and will speak to us because you speak, you reveal yourself to us through your word. Would your spirit move among us today? 
Would we not only be hearers of your word, but doers? Would you please be with all the families of those who have served this country, for those who have paid the ultimate price, the ultimate sacrifice, in laying down their life for this country? We thank you. Pray that they be honored this weekend. Um, and Lord, we pray for all of the people who are married in this room and for all those who are not, that you would, wherever we are with that, reveal to us what you have to say about marriage, God, and why it matters and what the gospel has to do with it. So let you speak now, Lord, and we give this time to you in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Amen, well, like I said, thank you guys for joining us. Um, I have to admit that when Pastor Rich asked me to preach about this, I got a little bit nervous. I got a little nervous with it, but after I got nervous, after I was done with that, I was reminded that when we read passages of scripture that talk about things like this, things that are difficult to hear for some of us because of what experiences we've gone through and what the culture has to say about things like marriage, I was reminded that it's not about our experience, it's not about our culture, it's not about any of that, it's about what does God have to say in his word. Because God's word is truth. And God's word is the truth that will change our lives if we're willing and we're ready to surrender to it. So let's listen to what God has to say this morning as we read from Ephesians chapter five. We're gonna be in verses 22 to 33, the last part of chapter five as we've been walking through the book of Ephesians together as a church. If you're a guest, thank you for joining this morning. If you're listening online, thank you for joining as well. We've been going through the book of Ephesians and we're gonna continue that today. So beginning in verse 22, God's word says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word, he did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hates his own flesh but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church since we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and to the church, and the church. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. So how does the gospel change our lives? How does the gospel, what does the gospel do when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? When we turn our back on the world and turn to Jesus, that should change everything about us. But how does the gospel change our lives? Ephesians chapter five talks about that. Pastor Rich has shared this for the last couple weeks. One way is that the gospel gives us a desire for purity. Sexual immorality shouldn't even be heard of among us. That was earlier in chapter five. The gospel changes the way we talk. Obscene and foolish talking and crude joking are not suitable. The gospel changes the way we walk. We don't participate in works of darkness, rather we expose them because we're not children of darkness anymore, we are children of the light. We don't get drunk with wine, we don't live recklessly. Why? Because we would rather be filled with the Holy Spirit. We don't want anything to compromise our connection to God. We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. So the gospel doesn't just change our character. I think we know that. We know that the gospel is supposed to change us as people. But the gospel doesn't just change our character. The gospel changes our commitments and our understanding of what it means to be committed. One of the greatest commitments anybody can make is the commitment of marriage. Many of you know that. But what does God have to say about marriage? I think about on this, uh, this most recent election cycle and how one of the propositions was to vote to redefine in the California Constitution what marriage should be. And it doesn't matter what everybody else thinks because ultimately it's only God who can decide what marriage is. Between one man and one woman, 
That's what God's word says. That comes from the heart of God. We can't redefine marriage. We have to go to the creator. We have to go to the author, the one who, who founded and established it to see what he has to say. Because when we go about marriage his way, not the world's way, when we go about marriage his way, that shines a whole new light on what it's supposed to be, on, how, on what God intended it to be. So where does God start? He starts with wives. Verse 22, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And all the men said, amen. Right. Just wait, just wait, husbands. I'm talking to myself here too. Wives, you belong to your husband in the same way that you belong to Jesus. How do you belong to Jesus? How does any believer belong to Jesus? You belong to Jesus in submission to him because he's Lord and you're not. This isn't just about men and women, this is about Jesus. Marriage isn't necessarily about people so much as it is about God. You can't belong to Jesus if he's not your Lord and Savior. Jesus doesn't just save you, he's not just the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the Lion of Judah, Jesus is a mighty warrior, Jesus is a mighty king. Yes, he's a humble savior, yes, he's gentle and lowly, but he's more than just the baby that you see in your nativity sets at Christmas time. There's so much more to Jesus than that. Jesus is in heaven right now, and when the Father says it in the fullness of time, Jesus is going to return as a conquering king. Jesus is going to come in power and glory from on high, and he is going to retake this world. It's already his, but it will be fully realized. Yes, he's a humble savior, but he's a mighty king. Jesus doesn't force anybody into submission either. I'm kind of, <laughs> I'm glad he doesn't, but sometimes I also kind of wish that he would force us into submission because we can be very rebellious people. We can be very anti-God in different areas, even if we're in Christ. There's a dying to ourself that needs to take place, and that takes place daily. Jesus doesn't force anyone into submission, and God shouldn't have to force anyone into submission either. God shouldn't have to force you to submit to him. Once you see who God is, once you know who God is and what he's done for you, what more is there to make you want to submit to him? He's God, and you're not. And thank God for that. Thank God that none of us in here, no one is God but him. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So what makes someone submit to Jesus then? What made you submit to Jesus? I don't know about you, but for me it was because I finally understood how much he loved me. I finally understood what grace meant and that it wasn't just a, an excuse for me to go and live my life as I wanted with no regard for God. That's not what the grace of God is for. The grace of God, when you really understand it, is the only thing that can actually change you. God's grace changes you from the inside out. I don't know about you, but for me, I realized by the grace of God that this world could not satisfy me. For some of us, for some of you, maybe that took a long time to realize. Some of you are still trying to figure that out and find that out for yourself. That's one of the things, one of the issues that, it, that comes with being young is that you have your whole life ahead of you. And you do. But how many of you know that no matter what this world can offer you, what Jesus offers you is way better? It's just like that song that we sang, and until you really understand and know that Jesus is better than anything you're pursuing, you're not gonna know what that, what that means and what that's all about. Maybe you realize that the life you were living, the things you were doing, the plans you were pursuing weren't actually worth it. And there was a kind, powerful, and good God pursuing you. Submission, therefore, it's not a response to being forced into something. That's not love. Submission is a response to God's goodness. It's something that we do as God works in our life 
And he brings us to a point where we freely of our own will lay down our lives at the foot of the cross. And we say, Jesus, I'm all yours. You are Lord, you are King. When we submit to God, we also must submit to the things and people that he tells us to submit to. This is really important because we're not just submitting to whatever it is or whoever it is. We're submitting to the God behind it and to the God who is in power and authority over it. Verse 23, the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. The head directs the course of the body, not the other way around. I remember when I learned how to throw a baseball for the first time, before you do anything with your arms and legs, you've got to look at the person you're throwing to. Because if you're not looking at your target, then how can you expect to get anywhere close to your target? All right, I think about times when playing catch in the backyard as a kid, I would throw the ball and it would be over the fence because I would get too cocky and I would try to like do like this whole spin, no look thing. And then the fun's over because you gotta go get the ball back and who wants to do that? But I remember when I was learning how to hit a baseball, my coaches told me, maybe your coaches told you, keep your eye on the ball. Why? Because you can't hit what you can't see. Your head helps your body stay on course. So husbands, you thought you were getting off easy today. Husbands, <laughs> what course have you set for your marriage? Where are you directing your marriage to go? What course have you set for your family, if you even have a course? Because like it or not, your marriage and your family are going to go in the direction that you take them. That's the authority that God has given you. Because yes, he has given you that authority, but he's also entrusted you with responsibility to lead and shepherd your family faithfully under his authority over your life. As you go, so does your marriage. As you go, so does your family. Jesus has a course for his bride. Jesus has a course, and it's called the Great Commission. Take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Baptize those in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you because I'm with you to the end of the age. That's the direction Jesus is moving his bride in. That's the direction that Jesus is moving his church in. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of the water by the word. Marriage is about making you holy more than it is about making you happy. Marriage is to make you more like Jesus, which by the way, I know there are people in this room who aren't married and maybe you just tuned me out so far because you're like, well, I came to church and I got the whole marriage talk. That's not really what I was looking for. Well. In singleness or in marriage, as a Christian, the goal is the same. The goal is Jesus. The goal is to become more like Jesus. That's what it means to be holy. That's what it means to be sanctified, is to be more like Jesus. So whether you're single or whether you're married, it's the same thing. Paul says that marriage is a mystery, but it's about becoming more like Christ. And it speaks to the way that Jesus loves his bride. So this is for you too, even if you're not married today. For the young people out there who aren't married, but maybe you hope to be one day, you don't prepare for marriage once you get married. You prepare for it by being a follower of Jesus today. Because it's about becoming more like Jesus. So don't wait until you get close to that moment. Don't wait until you get to the altar before you're like, I should really figure out what this whole marriage thing is. Yes, there's, you can't prepare for everything, but there are things you can be doing now to grow as a follower of Jesus, so that way, if and when God should lead you into that opportunity, you're ready for it, or more ready than you would be at least. So verse uh, 25, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, to make her holy. Romans 5.8 says this, but God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How do you know somebody loves you? You might think about the way that they talk to you or, or, or what you guys um, get to share and get to do together, but love ultimately comes down to sacrifice. God doesn't just 
tell us he loves us from heaven. God showed us and demonstrated his love for us in sending his son Jesus to die for us. And aren't you glad that God's love for you doesn't depend on your love for God? If God's love for you depended on your love for him, then I don't think no one in this room would be loved by God because we don't naturally love God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If God waited for us to love him before he sent Jesus to die for us, then we'd still be waiting for Jesus. So husbands, if you're waiting for your wife to act a certain way, to dress a certain way, to talk a certain way, or to do anything like that before you love her, then you're not loving her like Jesus loves his bride. If you're waiting for all those things to happen before you start taking this seriously and before you start loving your wife, then you've got it all wrong. Because that would mean that love is conditional. When the kind of love that Paul talks about here in Ephesians 5, it's agape love, it's God's kind of love. It's a, it's a love that is unconditional. That's what our love for our spouse is supposed to be like. Love doesn't wait for somebody else to make the first move. Love is the first move. Maybe some of you have heard this, right? Especially as we move closer to Christmas. Jesus is the reason for the season. Some of you probably have decorations, right, for Christmas and things like that. Jesus is the reason for the season. Or maybe if you went to Walmart in July, it was already Christmas, apparently. I'm excited for Christmas, don't get me wrong, but I, I, I appreciate the buildup to Christmas, I, I do. But Jesus is more than just the reason for one season. Jesus is the reason for everything. Jesus is the reason why you exist. Jesus is the reason why everything in this world exists. Colossians 1.16 says this, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. What does this have to do with marriage? Why did I bring that up? Because anything that God creates is first and foremost for him. Anything that God creates, whether it's the world that we live in, you and your life, or the marriage that God has blessed you with, God created marriage because he wants to show the world who he is. God created the world so that people would be able to look at what he made and know that there's a divine creator. It's not just a cosmic accident. Uh, this isn't what I do professionally. For those who don't know, I'm a high school science teacher. Um, it's interesting because in high school I did not like science at all. Um, but then after I got saved, I realized that if science is learning more about the world that God made, then I should probably see what science is all about. And I, I loved it. God gave me a passion for that after I got saved. And I get to teach at a private Christian school, thankfully. And what that means is I get to teach science in the way that it's meant to be taught. With God as the creator of the universe. With God as the reason as to why everything exists in the way that it does. I get to tell young people every day that they're not just some kind of cosmic accident. They're not just here by random chance. It's not just nothingness. They have a purpose in life because there's a purposeful creator who put them together who put all this together. Romans 1.20 says, for his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. There is a God. This is the God who created the universe and it's the God who created marriage because God wants to send a message to the world through your marriage. God wants to send a message to the world and to demonstrate his love in his heart for you and for others through your marriage. To demonstrate the heart of God, however, both parties, the husband and the wife, must accept and live out their God-given roles in loving obedience to God. Wives demonstrate this in one way and husbands in another. Wives demonstrate the perfect submission of Jesus to his Father's will when they submit to their own husbands. Husbands demonstrate the perfect love of Jesus for his church when they love their wives. Both are important. Both are equally important because both show different aspects of God's character, of who Jesus is. It's not that easy, you might be thinking. I, I know. 
but neither is dying on a cross, and Jesus still did that. It's not that easy. Neither is dying to yourself, but Jesus still commands us to do that every day. It's not about if it's easy or not. It's about loving God and loving the people that he has called us to love, and that begins with our spouse. Let me ask you a question. Is your spouse worth it? Is your spouse worth it? The sacrifice you make for them, are they worth it? Let me ask you another question. Is Jesus worth it? Because it's not just for them, it's for Jesus. Is Jesus worth it? Is Jesus worth the time that you invest in your marriage? Is Jesus worth setting yourself aside so that the person closest to you in this life can come to know Jesus a little bit more each day through you and how you love and treat them? Are your kids worth it? Something uh, that I was told is that one of the best things you can give to your kids is a mom and dad who love Jesus and love each other. When your kids see that mom and dad love each other and that they're willing to work through their difficulties and their differences because it's worth it, because Jesus is worth it, their marriage is worth it, it shows them that they're worth it too. They feel secure and safe in that love that you have in that family. It's no wonder why Satan attacks the family so much. It's no wonder why Satan continues to attack our marriages and continues to try to get people to think that marriage is not what God says it is, it's what you, whatever you want it to be, or that it's just not worth it at all. Because why commit yourself when you'd rather have that door open and you can leave any time? That's not what this is supposed to be about. There's no commitment there. It's more than just saying I love you. It's about saying I love you with your life. Yes, your spouse needs to hear that. But yes, your spouse needs to see that too. Verse 28. Husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Most people care about their health, right? I, I bet if I asked most of you, if I asked you, most of you would say, yes, I care about my health. Some don't, but most do. The Bible says your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You're supposed to take care of yourself. You're not supposed to obsess over yourself because that's idolatry. There's enough of that in the world. It shouldn't be in the church. No, we should not be idolizing our health. But I am saying it's important to take care of yourself. Many guys I know, I'll talk to the guys. I know I've talked a lot to the guys today and it's because God's talking to the guys a lot with this. Most guys I know love to go to the gym. Like, that's... That's your, your sanctuary. That's where you go when life is crazy and you're frustrated and you want to go throw some bars and plates around. Check out your biceps in the mirror. I know, I know. Most guys I know, or other guys I know, they love to work on their cars. They got toys in the garage. They want to make sure that everything's working and... and that's obviously important. Other guys I know, in fact, many guys I know, they are devoted to the career that they have. They will slave away at work all day for a paycheck. You're supposed to work as a man. You're supposed to work. God calls you to do that. But think about this. What if you worked on your marriage as much as you worked out at the gym? What if you worked on your marriage as much as you worked on that car in the garage? What if you worked on your marriage as much as you worked on your career? What if your marriage was actually that important to you? What if you viewed it as one of the most important things that God has given you in your life? How might your marriage change? How might your wife change if you loved her that way? How might she become more of the woman that God created her to be if she saw how you were becoming the man that God created you to be when you loved her that way? Verse 29, no one ever hates his own flesh but provides and cares for it just as Christ does for the church since we're members of his body. And that word cares, it implies that God does, he, he, he provides for us, he meets our needs, but it also is more than that. It means to cherish 
There's a big difference between the things that you care about and the things that you cherish. That's a much deeper level of love than just, oh, okay, like I care about my dogs. I don't cherish my dogs. I hope they're not listening online. I care about them, but I don't cherish them. Many people do, and I'm not saying it's bad if you, you love your dogs, it's good, you should take care of your animals. But Jesus doesn't just care about his bride. Jesus doesn't just care about his church. He cherishes his bride. He cherishes his church. He's not just fulfilling some kind of obligation that he has because if he didn't, then no one else would. He desires his bride. He desires his church. He doesn't want his church to desire anything but him. He wants his church and his bride to have her eyes fixed on him as the source of life and goodness and every good thing that they need. When we were dating, my wife would ask me this question. Why me? Like, why, why do you love me? When we got more uh, serious about marriage, which, I mean, that was always the goal, right? I mean, why date somebody if you can't see yourself going? You have to make sure you're clear about your intentions. But why do you wanna marry me? And I would tell her about how beautiful she was and I would tell her how happy I was when I got to see her and what it was like to, to talk to her and FaceTime and all those good things. I would tell her about how much I loved her heart for God and how she treated everyone with kindness. But really, it was more than just what she did for me. It was just who she was. Like, I, I couldn't explain it. I just knew that this was the person that God had given to me. And I wanted to give myself to her in marriage. I wanted to commit myself before God and before our family and friends because she was worth it. I couldn't explain it, I just knew. But here's the thing. I didn't just say that to get brownie points, by the way. <laughs> my pursuit of my wife pales in comparison to Jesus' pursuit of his bride. The love that I have for my wife isn't even a drop in the ocean of the Father's love for you and I. The romantic movies that you watch, even the Hallmark ones, that kind of love pales in comparison to Jesus' pursuit of his bride. He loves you. He loved you before you even knew there was a God that existed before you were even around in any kind of capacity, before anything in this world existed, God knew you, God loved you, and God chose you to be his. Some of you need to be reminded of that today. Don't take my word for it. Let God speak for himself. Jeremiah 31, verse three. When Israel went to find rest, the Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued to extend faithful love to you. Because when God places his love on you, he doesn't take it away. His love continues, and he continuously extends faithful love to you because he's jealous about his name. And if you bear his name, then you can be assured of his faithful love to you in Christ. Psalm 23, 6. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. God's love pursues you. God's faithfulness pursues you. Zephaniah 3.17, the Lord your God is among you, a warrior who saves. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will be quiet in his love. He will delight in you with singing. What do you do when you really love someone? I'm not even musically gifted, and I've sang to my wife before. You sing over your, the ones that you love. You sing about the things that you love. God sings about you. He delights in you with singing. God delights in you. He doesn't just love you because he has to. He actually likes, he created you. He made you who you are. He loves you. Jesus cherishes his bride and husbands are to cherish their wives. Cherish in Greek is the word thalpo. 
I bet you didn't come here for a Greek lesson, but which comes from another word. It means it's thalo. So thalpo, thalo. And that means to warm up or to keep warm. That's the picture that we have here with this word cherish. How warm is your marriage? How is the flame of your marriage doing this morning? Has that warmth fizzled out? Did you start out great, but now it's starting to fizzle out? Even if only a few embers remain, all you need is a spark. All you need to do is add some kindling to that fire to get it burning bright again. Because if you don't tend to fire eventually, what's gonna happen? It's gonna burn out, right? The same is true for your marriage. It requires effort, it requires intentionality, it requires love, and it requires your best. And just like God put the responsibility on Adam in the garden, he puts the responsibility on men when it comes to marriage. So how do you cherish your wife, husbands? How do you compliment her? Do you just tell her, oh, you look nice today? Like, do you actually find creative ways to compliment your wife? When God created Eve, she was the only woman in the world. Do you make your wife feel like she's the only woman in the world? Or are there others that you think about? Do you let your work get in the way of that? Is your heart faithful to your wife? Does she feel like she's the only woman in the world when she's with you? I know that's a high standard, but that's how Jesus loves his bride. That's how Jesus loves his wife. Do you listen to her? As a husband, I found there are a few things more frustrating for my wife than when she tells me something and I say, "Uh uh-huh, but I don't know what she told me. I'm listening with one ear, but I'm not listening with both. It goes in one ear and out the other. Are you listening intently to your wife? Are you listening? Do you actually care what she has to say? Doesn't God have to care about what you have to say? He does. 1 Peter 3, 7. Husbands, in the same way, love, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with a weaker partner, showing them honor as co-heirs of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. If you don't care about the closest person in your life to you, why would God care about answering your prayers? Why? God cares about this a lot. God cares about everything he created because whatever he creates, his name is is tied to it. And he's jealous for his name. He's jealous for you. He's jealous for your spouse. He's jealous for your marriage. Verse 31. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. When God brings a man and woman together in marriage, they're no longer two. They are one. And one thing that I remember Pastor Rich sharing with me and Liz when we went through premarital counseling with him is it's not a 50-50 contribution. Right? It's not husbands give 50%, wives get 50%, it adds up to 100. You can check my math on that. It's 100-100. The husband is fully committed to the wife, and the wife is fully committed to the husband and to the marriage that God has given them. This is a picture of the Trinity. God is God the Father. The husband is like Jesus, God the Son. And the wife is like God the Spirit. God the Spirit, where does that come from? Well, God calls wives to be helpers. And the word for helper is actually the same word that Jesus uses to talk about the Holy Spirit. Helper doesn't mean less significant. Helper just means different in role. Just like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they are all one, they are all one in the Trinity, but they have distinct and different roles that they carry out. And what did Adam say when he first saw Eve for the first time? He read her a poem. At last, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. God didn't create two separate beings. God created Adam, and from Adam, he created Eve. It's one being created in the image of God. Male and female, God created them. Verse 33, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. 
And I know that when you hear me say these things and when you come across passages like this, it's really easy to say, yeah, but. Yeah, but you don't know how bad it is right now. Yeah, but you don't know half the struggles we've gone through. You don't know how close it, you don't know how close we are right now or how close we've come to just calling it quits. You don't know how hard it is. You don't know what my spouse did to me. You don't know how they treated me. You don't know how they talked to me. You don't know how my spouse snores. You don't know. Liz doesn't snore. And let me just tell I don't know. I, I don't. I can only point you to the one who does. I can only point you to the one who created you, who knows what it's like to be in your shoes, who experienced everything in this life because he identifies with us in our weakness. He himself became weak just as we are still fully God, but he knew what it like to be clothed in the fullness of humanity. I don't know what it's like for you. I'm sorry, I don't. I wish I did. I don't. But God does. So don't stay there. Because if you do, then you're depriving yourself of the freedom that God wants you to have. There's change that's possible. God knows that things need to change. You think that you care about your spouse more than God? God cares about him or her way more than you. God cares about your marriage more than you do, even on the best day of your marriage. God is invested in your marriage more than you could ever be. Don't forget that God is actively involved and at work in your marriage right now, even if it's really difficult. Trust him. Trust him. Remember that your spouse is human. This is something that I've been convicted on because my wife is amazing, as many of you know. But naturally, I find that I'm really hard on myself. I'm really hard on myself. I demand a lot of myself. I have have set unrealistic expectations oftentimes. And what this passage tells us is that the way we treat ourselves as husbands will affect the way that we treat our wives, right? The way we care about ourselves will affect the way that we care and cherish our wives. And what I found myself doing is sometimes I'll slip into being very critical. I'll slip into being easily frustrated. I'll slip into things where I forget that God gave her to me as a blessing that I do not deserve. I forget about that. But it's in those moments that I'm grateful that it's not just me and Liz in our marriage, Jesus is in our marriage. I don't know if we would be able to do this without Jesus. In fact, I'm convinced we wouldn't be able to. I'm convinced no one would really be able to without Jesus. You weren't created to do this without him. That goes for anything in the Christian life, not just marriage. That's why this is about way more than just marriage. This is about Jesus. You can't live as a Christian without Jesus. Why would you want to? Why would you set yourself up for failure in that way? Turn to Jesus. If you've taken your eyes off of him, turn back to him today. He's not making it difficult, you are. He doesn't want that for you. He wants you to find yourself in him again today. Your spouse is human. And ultimately, none of us has an excuse because we're all called to the same standard. We're all called to be more like Christ. And only Jesus can change somebody. But that doesn't mean you should say, God, will you change my spouse? (laughs) What if instead of doing that, you asked God to change you? What if you asked God to make you more like Christ and you just let him work on them? Because you can't force somebody else to become more like Jesus. God's already invested in that. God's already at work. And when you surrender to what he's doing, you'll find that he will give you opportunities to be a part of that in the other person's life. What if instead of waiting for your spouse to change before you love them and respect them like Jesus tells you to, husbands, you did it anyway, husbands and wives. 
Because that's what Jesus would do if he were you. What if instead of slaving away at your career, what if instead of spending all your time in the garage, what if instead of spending all your time with the boys, as much as that's needed, guys need guy time, but what if you made it a point to learn something new about your wife every day? What if you made it a point to learn something new about your spouse every day? Something my wife has shared with me is this idea of getting a, a PhD in your spouse. It's a, a high calling, right? It's a lot of work. But it's worth it. My wife is worth it. Our marriage is worth it. Our family is worth it. This church that we're a part of is worth it. The people in this community who need to see Jesus lived out in us, it's worth it. They are worth it. Because if the gospel has changed your life, then it will be evident in the way that you love, honor, and treat your spouse. After all, the church is made up of families. And when families are strong, so are churches. Praise God for a thriving children's ministry. And thank you for those who serve in that. And if you're considering, we could certainly use you. Because it's not just an investment in an hour and a half with some kids to make sure that they don't set the building on fire. <laughs> it's investing in the next generation. I got the opportunity to join um, Next Gen, our youth group here at church, for Peak this weekend. Raise your hand if you went to Peak this weekend, right? You see everyone over here? There you go. All right. It was an incredible time. It really was. It was a blessing to get to be a part of it. And there's some amazing things going on in the life of the young people in this church. Let me just tell you. This ministry is thriving. And if you want to see God at work, ask them about what God is doing in them. Ask someone who serves in children's ministry. God is doing amazing things in the life of our church. When, health, when families are healthy, when families are strong, when marriages are strong, the church will be strong. And when churches are strong, communities will be. And when communities change, the world changes. But what's needed? Well, if a marriage is gonna be strong, then a husband and wife have to be strong in Christ. It takes both people. I know that there are times when it feels like things are just so one-sided and it's like, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing. And they're just not getting the message. Give them some grace. Pray that God would give you grace. Pray that God's grace would reign in your marriage because even on our best day, we still need grace. We still need the grace of God. And the more we walk with Jesus, the more we're married, I think the more we come to realize that we really do need more and more grace. And God is faithful to give that to us in abundance. I'm grateful for all the, the advice that I've been given by people in this church, by the way that people like you guys care about me and Liz and you wanna see us succeed and thrive in our marriage. You wanna see our family thrive, and you've helped us so much, and I wanna say thank you. But know that it's gonna take effort, it's gonna take work, it's gonna take dedication, it's gonna take commitment, and what empowers you to actually live out that commitment is Jesus, it's the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same Spirit that lives in you if you are a follower of Christ. And if you're not a Christian and you're struggling in your marriage, then what you need to do is you need to come to Christ. It's the only way it's gonna work. And even after that, it's still gonna be worked and God's gonna be faithful and God's gonna work in you. Because even if you are in Christ, you know that to be true. But remember this, that Jesus doesn't just exist to make your marriage better. It's more than that. There's a life, a new life waiting for you in Christ. If all Jesus is to you is some kind of divine marriage counselor, then you are missing out on everything there is to know about Jesus. He's so much more. One of the things we did uh, at Peak this weekend was we learned more about who Jesus is. And it's so hard to just say, this is who Jesus is in 36 hours. Right? You cannot put a time limit on how much it's gonna take to learn more about Jesus. That's why we're gonna have an eternity to do it you're gonna have an, art, an eternity to learn about Jesus because that's what it's going to take. So what I wanna do 
is I wanna close our time together today with a word of prayer. So let's bow our heads, close our eyes, and go to the Lord together. Heavenly Father, you are God and we're not. I don't know where everybody is today, but I do know that one thing that is true is that we are all here today for a reason. It's not an accident for us that we're in this place. God, I know that all of us have different experiences when it comes to marriage. I know that some of us are in really rocky situations right now. And what I pray, Lord, is that you would show anybody in this room who's in that situation that not only are you more than enough for their marriage, you're more than enough for their life. I pray that you would please reveal to them that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through you. And I pray, Lord, that you would please empower with your Holy Spirit everyone who is married in this room to live out this command, these commands, to step into the roles that God has given them faithfully and obediently, not because they're forced, but because you're working in their heart right now and you have something amazing planned for them. Jesus, it's to you that all this is for. We give you the credit, the glory, and the praise. And Lord, I pray that as we celebrate you with baptism right now, that we would be reminded that you can and do impossible things because nothing is impossible for you. So if we're in an impossible situation today, remind us that you are the only one who can pull us out of that, Lord, and get us back on solid ground where you want us to stand, where we stand on the rock of Christ. So thank you, Lord Jesus, and it's in your great name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.